Hello, hello. We made it. Yes, you can still. The, uh, the oh, ultimate uh, free midterm break class. Very exciting. Uh, it might even be a livable temperature outside at some some small fraction of the weekend. Uh, any questions to get us started off? Good. You have to do the end of file like the zero. We have to implement that ourselves, right? So you're talking about when someone is reading from a pipe where the right end is closed. Yes. Uh, you do like you do have to handle that case. Yeah. Um, but I think that the only thing you don't want to do when the right end is closed is wait for more stuff to be written. So if you do that, you're going to be waiting forever. But otherwise, it's completely the same. So to return a zero, you would just like the same code that normally would wait and then read some bytes and then return the number of bytes. If you include in that logic something about the right end being closed, you read, you don't wait, there is zero, but you try and read, there are zero bytes read and you return zero. So I think in practice, you probably don't need a bunch of special case code. So you could do it that way. Uh, but yes, you are responsible for when there's a read and the right end is closed. Read keeps reading any unread bytes in the pipe. And if there are no unread, unread bytes, it doesn't read any of them. And it's always returning the number of bytes it read. So when it doesn't read any, it should be returning zero. Other questions? All right. So quick. Uh, recap of the address translation strategy uh, from last time. That was our base and bound, where every virtual address uh, is an offset to some base physical address, and we check that it's valid by it staying within the sort of region of physical memory that is allocated for a particular process. So we're checking the virtual address against a bound and adding it onto a base. Really simple, uh, fast hardware translation. So this is simple and fast. It gives us our memory protection. Processes aren't going to be able to touch memory that doesn't belong to them. And we're doing it with just two register values per process. Just this base and bound, no other information. So the kind of, uh, memory or hardware overhead here, super low. But a number of downsides. A process can overwrite its own code. We can't implement any sort of restrictions on what a process can do in the region of memory it's given. Because we're just checking is it the is the memory access within that region. We have no way to share memory between processes. Uh, uh, since they're each going to need to reserve separate regions. Uh, and we'll see, uh, and uh, the sharing kind of the, the most, one of the, the compelling cases to me is just think of some life, the code for some shared library like printf, we'd really like that to be shared rather than having separate copies for each process. And we don't necessarily have a good way to grow uh, the, uh, a stack and a heap. Since we've reserved each process a region of memory, uh, and we can change the base to maybe move it somewhere else, and maybe we can change the bound 
to give it more space. But it's sort of changing the overall region, and there'd be a number of things we have to worry about, about running into other regions. So uh, it at least makes it like challenging to have our, our growing uh, stack and heat. Uh, questions on base and bounds? This feeling good about this? All right, so let's uh, make an improvement to our, our base and bound. I mean, it was fast, but super limited. Um, and so a kind of evolution of base and bound, and one that turns out to be really useful and is still widely used today. is the idea of segmentation and our key idea here is Let's replace our single base and bound with a kind of set of multiple bases and bounds that are going to divide our memory into multiple segments. So let me draw a picture of what this might look like. So we have Uh, the view of the world that the CPU gets, which is there's a CPU, and then there are multiple segments of virtual memory. There's uh, the stack, the heap, segment for data, a segment for code, and these segments where hopefully familiar with, or it has these different segments of memory. And the CPU's view is, oh, I just use a virtual address and get some data out of some, some signal. What the kind of implementation of this would do is our CPU uh, requests data at some virtual address. And as, uh, as we come up a running theme, we're going to divide this virtual address into different pieces. We're going to uh, into a segment and an offset. And as part of this, we'll have a segment table, which is keeping track of information about each of our segments. Importantly, we need a base and a bound. We need something that kind of determines the region of memory that each of our segments has. So we'll have a base and a bound. And then we'll also keep information about kind of how the process is allowed to access memory in that segment. And what I mean is there might be some segments that read only, such as our uh, our Code segment might be a read-only segment. We don't want to let uh, processes uh, change their own their own code. Uh, and our other regions 
the program to both read and write the memory there. And so we're going to use the segment as an index into our segment table. So some portion of our virtual address will separate that off, perhaps kind of a, a bitwise sort of operation. Use that as an index into our segment table. And this will give us the bound, uh, the base and the bound for that segment. And then we're back to doing our kind of base and bound uh, translation, but just for this specific case. So uh, we take the base and we add the base to the offset in order to get the actual physical address. So just like we were doing with uh, base and bound, we have a base, we add on to uh, some part of our virtual address is going to give us uh, our, our base, our, our physical address. And also like before, we're checking the offset against some bound to make sure it's not outside the region uh, that's been uh, reserved for that, for that segment. Uh, and then once we have this physical address, that is what is actually kind of telling us where to go in physical memory to find that data that the CPU is looking for. Does this make sense? What are your what are your questions on this this process? Kelly. So this seems very similar to the page table we learned about in Joy. Is the difference just like page tables are used in caches and this is used by the CPU? Yes. So uh, we will talk about page tables shortly, and we will see how this fits together. Uh, for those of you who are, who are also thinking page tables from 208, a page is a fixed size, a segment, these segments can be different sizes. There's nothing that says the stack segment has to be the same size as the data segment. Other questions? Right. This is about, like the hardware itself. Like, the software has no control over. Or, like, how much control does the software have? Like, can, can the software say make this like, make this base have this bound, or is that like just picked by the by like the hardware itself? Uh, so I I would think what determines these base and bounds is an implementation detail. I can imagine uh, the kernel having some role in that, or being handled entirely by the hardware. Uh, the translation process uh, is almost certainly handled by hardware. Um, but this segment table would need to exist somewhere in our system. And we would need a, a, a segment table for each process. Which means, okay, this segment table needs to be in memory somewhere. It needs to like be stored somewhere so we can actually look retrieve it when we're doing this address translation. So the translation, likely entirely in hardware, but that hardware process is accessing me memory wherever, like the segment table needs to exist somewhere in physical memory for each process. David. Is that all for OH? Uh, it is short for offset. This is sort for segment. Other questions? So, one nice thing about this is that these different segments, they can be located anywhere in physical memory. Unlike our original base and bound, where the entirety of a process's physical memory had to be one big chunk, now we have some flexibility. We each segment, we can stick it in a different spot in physical memory. Uh, 
when our, our offset exceeds the bound. Like if we exceed the bound, That will trigger a uh, ex a CPU exception, and in Linux and Unix-based systems, this is called a segmentation fault. So when your C program accesses a memory address outside the kind of segments that it's allowed to access, you get a segmentation fault. For example, the address zero is not going to be part of any segment. So when you try and access address zero, such as dereferencing a null pointer, the system says, no, that's not part of any valid segment segmentation fault. Owen? Does the segment of offset, does that like split this? That's like the same for everything, right? Like isn't there sometimes like a max bound you can have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like whenever you have a bound less than that, you're just like wasting units. Like you're just using that act, you just can't access the level up. So, uh, we have some virtual address space that we've divided up into these segments. Um, and the size of that virtual address space determines the size of our virtual address. Like every byte in our virtual address space has its own virtual address. Um, and so, yes, yeah, some portion of that virtual address will be used as the offset, and some portion is the segment. Um, and so, yeah, the size of our virtual address space will determine also the kind of maximum, like the, the size of any given segment. So, so like, when, like, can you split the segments off? Like, that's like, you just say, like, split like, the 10th from the last bit every time? It's like, it's not like, you know, like, more, it's not like right now. Uh, correct. This would be some, like, every time we take the first uh, n bits of the offset and the rest are the same. True, yes. We're, but it's very likely that our virtual address space is bigger than physical memory. And so the fact that we uh, have a limited bound, that bound is still probably bigger than the physical memory we have. Uh, so it's, in that sense, like it's not a problem that it would be limited because going up to that limit wouldn't necessarily be feasible. Other questions? All right, so we have some flexibility in terms of where we, where we put these segments. Another nice thing uh, that segmentation gives us is This segmentation will facilitate sharing of memory. And what I mean by that is imagine that we have segment table for process zero, and we have another segment table for process one, and in this scenario, process zero and process one are just two instances of, this, instances of the same program. So two instances of uh, a text editor, for example. And if there are two instances of the same program, their code should be exactly the same. They're running the same program, same instruction. Uh, and in our original base and bound, we had no way for say, okay, the code stuff in memory, have that be shared, but everything else needs to be different. Because when two text editor, text, uh, two instances of this text editor are running, they're going to have kind of different data and they're stacked in a heap, um, and so those need to be separate. But What segmentation allows us to do is that uh, 
we can, for example, make the bases for these two segments the same. And so the virtual addresses will process zero when it accesses code. Translate to the same physical address that process one gets when it uses a virtual address to access code. Um, for the previous, you know, base and bound, um, we were thinking about changing its own source code. Um, that would have just done, but now that we're sharing space, would it change in one uh, of the processes in the code also affect the other? Yes, this is absolutely an important concern to keep in mind when we're sharing memory. What if one process changes it? This might affect the other, and we want this isolation. Fortunately, the code segment is read only. So neither of them are allowed to change this at all, and so it's fine if both of them just read the same data without changing it. Okay. So um, are those both pointer points the same thing? Basically, in P1 is the first index, and P0 point the same thing. Yeah, you, that, that's a reasonable way to think about it. They're kind of both uh, the segment, the code segment for P1 and the code segment for P0 both point to the same region of physical memory. And so the same kind of uh, the, the code for their, our text editor is just appears once in physical memory, uh, and both our processes are, are reading that, that same memory. Other questions? All right, so we have sharing, uh, which is nice. Uh, we can also use segmentation to avoid unnecessary copying. Using what is known as copy on write. This has come up before. Um, does anyone re remember where this uh, phrase copy on write came up before? What? Just a bridge step the copy. Or just copy. You bring something in, and then um, you don't actually like bring it in until you write it. But you don't actually copy it over until you write it. I guess we're duplicating um, something. Yeah, so this, this sort of right back uh, idea that we talked about with caches is sort of thinking along similar lines that we want to avoid uh, kind of this, we want to postpone this work of writing change data out of the cache until maybe more changes accumulate. But this copy and write is something a little different. Back and forth in processes, right? Yes, so what happens when we, uh, what happens with memory when we run for? Yeah. Exactly. The one we for we copy the parent's memory to child. But imagine the situation where uh, we fork, uh, we copy the memory to child, uh, and then we call exec. And we just completely replace the child's memory with a new, to start it running a new program. That would mean 100% of the copying we did was useless, or like 99%. So if we're going to do a bunch of work and 99% of it is useless, we'd really like to find a way to not do that work. Uh, and that's this copy and write idea uh, that segments allow us to, to do in a nice way. So uh, instead of this, we'll just copy the segment table from the parent to the child. And we'll mark all segments in both the parent and the child, we'll mark them all read only. So we'll change all of our kind of accesses for all the, the segments in both to read only. And so then 
either the child or parent attempted to write to one of our segments, this will trigger an exception that will send that will give control over to the terminal. And at this time, and only when either the child or parent attempt to write to a segment, then only at this point would we actually copy over the memory. Is there lab five? Uh, yes, lab five. You will be implementing copy on write before. There. Would you uh, copy just that segment or uh, all of the other data that you need to copy? Uh, unless you had some strong reason to believe that you would very shortly need to copy the other segments, but I don't think that you would have that information. You would only copy the, the particular segment that that was being written to. One. Is that in like the same read only that you have the code section? Because wouldn't that like then also edit the code section or just like copy over? Or is it like a special read only class like read only but can edit kind of? Yes, so doing this copy on write would require some extra metadata to differentiate between a code segment that should always be read only versus one that we have temporarily made read only but when it's written to, we'll kind of copy it and then mark it as, as read write. So, yes, I, I agree that we need some way to distinguish in kind of different read only modes. Other questions? All right, so we've, we have sharing, we've uh, avoided some unnecessary copying. Uh, by only needing to copy segments that, that get written to. And uh, there's another a nice uh, uh, nice technique that will Avoid unnecessary zero. So let me describe what I mean uh, by this. When we, whenever we give a process new memory, We need to write zero to every byte of whatever new chunk of memory we're giving to the process. And that's what I mean by zero. Uh, why would we need to do this, or, or what bad thing might happen if we didn't write these zeros? It's like if you use after three times, where one process can request all the memory that the system has and just like read everything from all the killed processes. And then maybe find out stuff that like maybe you put your password in some process that then stored in memory and then tweet it, but it's still just sitting there. Exactly. That when we give memory to a process, that memory may have been used by some previously running process. There may be data that we don't want sort of leaked or exposed uh, to uh, in order to, to kind of protect processes' memory from each other, this sort of uh, extends after death. That process, even when a process exits, stuff that it had in its own memory shouldn't be revealed to, to other processes. So we need to, to uh, make all zeros. Uh, but if we're giving a process uh, 512 
megabytes of memory, and the process only ever uses one kilobyte, well, we wrote a lot of zeros that we didn't need to. Because the, the, we zeroed out a lot of memory that was just never, ever accessed. So, uh, what we can do using our segments uh, is we reserve some larger space yellow down uh, zero out just the first few kilobytes and set Set the bound to just the zero portion. And we're going to take advantage of the same kind of uh, kernel involvement that we used with copy on write, where okay, we've set the bound such that if this process accesses any memory that we didn't zero, we're going to trap into the kernel. And at that point, we can zero out the memory that we need to. So that because we set the bounds to just a zero portion, access to something outside of that will trigger uh, uh, a fault, and then the kernel will be able to zero out the memory that is being accessed now and change the bound appropriately. And so this strategy is called zero on reference, where we only do our zeroing kind of just before the memory is going to be referenced and not Try and do it all ahead of time because it might turn out to be wasted effort. Daryl? So, a segmentation call does have to like, end the process? Correct. That, in fact, these two strategies uh, rely on uh, the system triggers a segmentation fault, and then we have uh, some code that decides uh, can't, uh, should I do something? that will like make this okay? Like is this sort of an expected segmentation fault or is this a no-no and the process should die? Other questions? All right, so we have our segmentation approach. Uh, we have a nice, uh, properties here. Uh, we have one I didn't mention, which is now that our stack and heap are these separate segments, we can easily throw them as needed. This would be another instance where the user triggers a segmentation fault by kind of trying to, to push something that, say, outside the stack region. The program shouldn't necessarily uh, abort. The system can just grow the stack segment to have room for a bigger stack. And because all these segments are, we're able to kind of locate them separately in physical memory, it's easier to manage how they grow. But unfortunately, not easy enough. So these are our pros over here, cons of our segment. Memory management has become kind of complex under this, 
for any segment, we need to find a chunk of free memory of some particular size. And these may be all sorts of different sizes uh, of the, the segments that we need. Uh, and as you may remember from implementing malloc in 208, there are a number of issues when we have some uh, region of memory that we're dividing up into different sized chunks. There's a lot of complex management that goes along potential wasted space. Um, and uh, so this means that if we need to rearrange a bunch of segments, this is going to be an expensive operation. And we may have chunks of memory between segments that are like not big enough to hold the new segment we want to create. And so they end up as, as kind of wasted unused space, uh, which is called external fragmentation. Do these pros and cons make sense? Any questions on this? All right. So like to have an interlude about Chester A. Arthur, our 21st president, uh, took over when Garfield was uh, assassinated. Uh, Arthur is, is one of our uh, more forgettable uh, United States presidents, um, was a kind of uh, member in good standing of the um, New York political machine. Uh, uh, a loyal follower of this guy named Roscoe Conklin, who uh, was a, a very influential politician and sort of um, dominated New York politics. But when Arthur gets into office, he's actually turns out to be kind of a moderate reformer, uh, makes some civil service reforms, um, takes some, some positive action on, on uh, uh, civil rights and uh, Native American rights. He also attempts to stop, uh, uh, but unsuccessfully, the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act uh, that Congress passed uh, that banned all immigration from, from China for 10 years. Um, and uh, at, at the end of the term, his, uh, kind of, he finishes out Garfield's term, and by the end, he's kind of in poor health and doesn't really um, mount any effort to, to be reelected. Um, other interesting point, U.S. politics was highly polarized at this point, but not in the kind of liberal and conservative way uh, we might think of today. Uh, it was polarized very sectionally. You can see that in Garfield, when, when Garfield and, and uh, Arthur were on the ticket, kind of northern states voted for the Republicans, southern states solidly to the Democrat. Um, and kind of the, the big polarizing issues were things like the tariff, taxes on imported important good. All right, that's our, our U.S. history aside. So have a little bit of time uh, left, so uh, we'd like to uh, get into something that was alluded to earlier, which is how are we going to solve this problem? But we all have all these different size segments and sort of arranging them uh, efficiently in memory is quite difficult. And the solution is Uh, a strategy called paging, where we're going to manage memory in fixed size chunks. Uh, and so both physical and virtual memory will be divided up into these pages. And uh, now instead of a segment table, 
each process will have a page table that will translate our virtual address in a corresponding page. And then we'll use a, a mechanism very similar to our segment table, where we're going to split up our virtual address. Part of it will index the page table. The other part will put together with uh, information from the page table, and that will give us our, our physical address. And so one of the difficulties was finding like the free memory we need uh, was, was difficult under segments. Uh, but we can use something called a bitmap in order to uh, find free pages. So, uh, for example, if our physical memory is divided up into these seven pages, and we have four of them allocated and three of them free. Our bitmap would be just a binary uh, a vector, just uh, we have a single bit for each page where a 1 indicates that the page is allocated, a 0 indicates that it is free. So we, with uh, 1 bit per page, so just with 7 bits, we'd say allocated, free, allocated, allocated, free, allocated, free. And so this makes it very easy to kind of find where. Uh, unavailable pages and easy and kind of low order to keep track of which pages are allocated. Uh, because when everything is different sizes, we have to kind of search through all the chunks to find a chunk that's big enough for what we need. But now that everything is in these fixed size chunks, we can just kind of find any free chunk will be a free page that we need. If possible. Uh, yes, excellent question. Uh, processes will absolutely need to use more than one page. But the one of the beauties of this paging approach is that we have our virtual memory here. And let's say that our, our data is made up of uh, two virtual pages. Those two pages, even though they're next to each other in physical memory, can go or in virtual memory can go anywhere in physical memory. So here we can have kind of the first data page, and over here we have the second data page, uh, and that applies to the pages in any of these segments. And so because now we can uh, easily scatter a process's memory uh, kind of anywhere we want in physical memory, even if we need three pages, any three free pages will do. Uh, and our page table will take care of translating the virtual address to the physical address for the corresponding page. Does that make sense? Questions on? Locating pages in memory. All right, so I think I'll stop there for now. Uh, and we'll pick up uh, after a midterm break uh, with a lot more on, on paging uh, and 
uh, a series of optimizations that we'll need to make this work uh, in practice. So have a great midterm break, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Um, Nobody knows just how it started. Somebody.